Higher is, is Armani than Lars von Trier is Versace. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I wanted to ask for some clarifications about some things that you've said tonight. Uh, you were talking about spirituality as opposed to religiosity and dealing with spirituality and, and the attempts to, to communicate the spiritual experience and treating it as, 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 you know, as a transcendent other. But how can you communicate that in, in any art form? Because you, you seem to be putting what at least appear to me to be somewhat arbitrary constraints that they have to move through time. Well, it's, uh, yeah, I know. I, I, did I mean, you I, hear I, him? I just, ultimately, I, just, I don't understand uh, how something for a film, for example, for a film to be spiritual, it has to be a quiet film. It has to be a Bresson film. It has to be an Ozu film. And why it has to be quiet, uh, you know, still. Because one of my favorite films uh, is The Passion of Joan of Arc by Carl Theodore Dreyer. But that seems like an extremely busy film, uh, even though they're just sort of in the room discussing. It's like it's constantly moving. Yeah. It's constantly cutting. There's that pendulum cam on, on Maria Falconetti. It seems like a film that's full of emotion and full of it. And it's spirituality almost seems to derive from this, this movement, from the particular movements of the faces. And it seems to communicate a deep spirituality through movement and personifying it in the personal through Maria Falconetti and through these inquisitors and Ansel Nalto and all these people that are, that are, that are there. And I think that you, know, you wrote yourself on, on Dreyer, and I think this film alone sort of goes counter to, to Yeah, I mean, I understand what you're saying. And, and in fact, I, 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 think, I think less of, of Jean d'Arc. I, I, I like Bresson's Jean d'Arc better than Dreyer's for just that reason. But also, you know, like I said at the very beginning, this is such a thorny patch that, in a way, everything you manage to say is transitory in a way, because there, you're never going to solve any of this stuff. I, I believe that just as eminence is the enemy of transcendence, going back to what was said earlier, I believe that emotional identification is the enemy of spiritual awareness. Now, that's a, that's a call I make. That's a decision I make about my own notion of what is spiritual awareness, about the role of meditation, and the role of, uh, of, of my own spiritual needs. But, but, uh, but my question then is from that, how can you say that, for example, music is more spiritual? Expression. Well, it in, in some not ways, necessarily to emotional identification, or not yeah. necessarily even to the inversion of the standard tropes. Of the yeah, I mean, in, in some ways, non-narrative cinema, you know, like Michael Snow or Ernie Gare, you know, you know, is in some ways quite spiritual cinema. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, I've seen how traditional Dutch CRC families were portrayed in your movie, Hardcore. Um, you obviously spent a lot of time in Grand Rapids. Um, I had a couple questions for you. How did your time at Calvin shape your spiritual life? Did you find yourself moving away from their more conservative ideals to explore spirituality on your own terms? Well, uh, Calvin for me was just the end of a, a string of schools. You know, so it was Westside Christian, Grand Rapids Christian High, Calvin. It was like one big school. Um, and uh, uh, I, I liked Calvin a lot. I had a great time. But then I was there at the perfect time. I was there while the world was alive. You know, college was alive. It was full of revolution in the air. There was a sexual revolution, drug revolution, civil rights revolution, anti-establishment, anti-military. You know, I was running the college newspaper. The newspaper got shut down. I started a film society. The film society got shut down. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And then like I went I out to uh, Los Angeles, and I ran into, ran into the students 
who had no real idea of where they had come from. I had a very clear idea where I had come from, and I knew I wasn't going back. And, uh, <laughs> and so you know, it was very, very useful for me that way. And I had great uh, professors, uh, a number of whom have spoken here. Uh, uh, Nick Waldersdorf, Louis Smedes, Planninga, they were all professors at Calvin. And uh, it, it, was a, it was a great uh, education. Uh, but mostly, for me at that time, it was, you know, uh, what's the phrase in the Bible? To kick against the pricks? Uh, that, that's how I spent most of my college years. <laughs> I want to thank you, first of all, for your film, Mishima. It's uh, possibly my favorite film of all time. And, uh, and I'm going to join in the parade of young, idealistic film students who are still fighting for the possibility of spirituality in film. Uh, most of your comments were regarding narrative cinema, I thought. So isn't there a possibility that in experimental film, in films like the Koyaanisqatsi series, that still possible to achieve spirituality yeah. through music and a absolutely and, and i think the odds are m uh, much better at doing it because then you're going to get into abstract imagery and the use of uh, the way you use music and taking people through certain shifts and planes uh i, I think you know it, it's i think it's much easier to bring people toward a meditative state uh through non-narrative cinema than through narrative cinema well, do you think there's any possibility? Where, where does the, the translation of spirituality get lost in between uh, an experimental film and then when story is added to it? Well, the narrative cinema, again, demands audience identification, audience empathy. It demands that you have, it, it reinforces, promotes all of, of human feelings. It brings everything down to emotion. And emotion is one of the things you're trying to get away from. So, you know, how can you use an art form that is designed to create these emotions when emotion may be the enemy of the awareness? Thank you. Hi, Paul. I hate to be the only one to challenge anything you said earlier. Um, <laughs> But uh, I was just uh, thinking about some of the films that you've done that are as, seem much more strictly narrative in your own definition, um, particularly affliction and then autofocus. Uh, two narratives that were particularly absorbed with characters trying to kind of overcome very human, uh, kind of a human condition. And in a way, maybe they're lost, but they're trying to find a more spiritual place. And I was just wondering if that seems to be, if maybe you kind of, that was your whole objective here is to show that like you're the only narrative director that can actually accomplish that. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I, I, I think there is, there is some sort of fun in that, in that failed enterprise. I mean, there is a, there is a character that I've always sort of liked and I find myself returning to, and that's a kind of a drifter, a kind of fellow who sneaks around the edge of society and peeps in people's windows and looks at their lives and says, you know, I wish I could have a life like that, but it doesn't know how to get one. That's a kind of spiritual yearning. And I like to, to address that, but I don't take it to. You know, they never actually get inside the room. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could um, touch on the idea of um, spirituality through creativity and um, like your process. I'm sorry. Um, you talked a little bit about like parallels between um, your creative journey and your spiritual journey. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, that's, it's hard to talk about because I, I guess it's different for everybody, you know. And there are moments uh, when either as a creator of, of something, or more often as a, a viewer of something. Uh, you just feel this extraordinary power. Uh, and it's the same kind of power that you can feel you know, in a church pew or a, uh, a holy place. Um, I don't know quite how to define it. 
you know, um, and it's different for everybody, you know. So uh, I, guess, I guess the answer is I don't know. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I'm not a film scholar or a, a film student, uh, but thankfully I am a, a fan of, of Dreyer and a big fan of Brisson, but uh, I wasn't, uh, I'm sorry to say, I wasn't familiar with any of the directors you mentioned that are contemporary that are, you consider are approaching this. Could you repeat their names? And also... Yeah, I, well, I mean, I think probably a nice film to start with is, is Mother and Son by Alexander Sokharov, which is about 90 minutes long, has about uh, two dozen shots and about 12 words of dialogue in it, talking about moving away from narrative. It is really quite extraordinary. Uh, he has a new film called Father and Son, but I haven't seen that yet. Uh, Theo Angelopoulos is a Greek filmmaker who does very, very slow stuff. He, has, he had a film at Venice, but the, the, one, the best one to see is the one with the word angel in the title. I forget the name of it. Maybe you don't, Eugene. Uh, Bella Tarr is a Czech filmmaker who makes, uh, um, again, very glacial movies. Uh, there's a film called Eureka, which is a Japanese film like that, and there's this Korean film we were talking about earlier called Spring, it's the season, Spring, Summer, Fall, Winter. Uh, that just came out. In fact, they're going to show it here, right? Right, uh, the Korean film. Yeah, so they're going to be... Who's that director? What? Who's that director of the, the season? This is the Korean we can't remember. Oh, yeah, it, okay. <laughs> It's something with a dash in it. Uh, it it's, uh, the, uh, if it's in the Bijou, I can, I can find it. Um, and, and some people think that Tarkovsky is spiritual. I, 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 I have a problem with Tarkovsky a bit. The, the but sacrifice. he certainly is, 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 is working that area. Mm -hmm. you know. Thanks. Hi there. I have a question about three characters in uh, three of your films. Um, Travis Bickle, uh, Mishima, and Ali Fox in uh, Mosquito Coast, where the three of them seem to possess a kind of evangelical fervor, um, at least upon my reading. And they seem to, I don't know if, if they are maybe engaged in the antithesis of a spiritual quest where they become undone by a kind of, uh, you know, emotional response, these loners that are guided by this feeling to set something right, and the engage, do, are they, could they be engaged on the opposite of a spiritual quest because they're undone by this? Well, I mean, I, I think the answer is really much simpler. I, I, I was raised to be a minister. I went, you know, door to door as a kid. You know, have you found Jesus Christ your personal savior? Um, and, uh, and I had drifted away from that and, and, and found a soapbox of a different sort. Traded the pulpit in, you know, for, for, the soapbox of, uh, of, of, of an artist. So characters like that appeal to me because they're just me. I mean, you know, once you have that proselytizing urge, once you fantasize as a child about going into the fields, you know, because the fields are ripe and God is calling you, and PC in the sky, you know, says preach Christ, when really, you know, the old joke, and plant corn. Uh, that, uh, you know, once you're raised with that, you know, you're sort of stuck with it in a way. You know, and the fact that you can't go home again is, 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 is tied to the fact that you can't get, get away from it either. And uh, so, you know, people like that sort of appeal to me, people who have that, that kind of evangelical urge, but of course, it always has to be twisted and bent for it to be of any interest anymore. I guess I had a little question about this concept of, of the transcendent and, and how you're um, almost forced not to approach uh, a human characteristic in order to approach in some way the transcendent. And I, I guess what I would ask is, how do you come up with any conception of what transcendence <laughs> is, yeah. except for in contrast to what it's not? Yeah. And if it's if you're only based on what it's not, wouldn't sarcastic, lonely films be the best way to approach the transcendent? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that, of course, is a, you know, that's a theological conundrum, you know. Uh, how can, you know, how can a human know the, the unknowable, you know? Um, and, uh, and the answer, you know, going back to John Calvin, is this whole notion of sensus divinitatis. You know, there's something in us that was put there that spots this stuff. So, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I propose this whole notion of spirituality and awareness and all that, but, uh, but in the end, it's just what I believe. I mean, uh, uh, you know, it's the multiplicity of experience is just too great for, for me to try to say I'm right and you're wrong. Well, I, I guess that's what I was, even in, I, I'm not asking to say what's right or what's wrong, just uh, in your conception, would that be, that movement is, is really about moving? Well, well, one of the things I saw in Bresson's film is that, you can make a film about a man in a room. And those were the two characters, you know, a man in a room. And, you know, that's how I was able to create Taxi Driver. I realized, you know, that's enough. If you have a man and you have a room, you can make a movie. And, and so that sense of solitude, uh, I think, is, is, is really critical. And uh, with Bresson, of course, it all is involved with the prison metaphors. You know, you know, you know until you're in prison, you can't be free. You know, the body is a prison house of the soul. You know, Bresson had a chance in its background, which is really the sort of French version of Calvinism. Thank you. Hi. I um, actually wrote my master's thesis uh, using your book, Transcendental Style and Film, <laughs> to sort of um, apply it to um, an independent filmmaker, a US filmmaker called Hal Hartley, uh, especially uh, his film Trust, where he's... Um, Which film? Trust, Trust, where he has a, um, an, actor, an actress who is, becomes a, sort of a mother, uh, sort of a Maria figure, sort of a Virgin Mary figure. Um, and so um, now I'm, um, I've, wrote, I've written on um, the, another film, another independent filmmaker, um, Dead Man. I don't know if you've seen it uh, by Jim Jarmusch. Dead oh, Man. the one with Johnny Depp? Yes, yeah. yes, that's the one. Where, that I found extremely transcendental um, mm -hmm. the, using the... Um, Native American spirituality, and also using uh, the music of Neil Young. That, uh, to me, uh, each time I see it, I, I can't get tired of this film. Each time I see it, I just find new things uh, to look at. And, um, and uh, I guess I have a second small question: Is I teach a, a class on film and literature this semester, uh, on and what? Um, film and literature adaptation, yeah. and I just wanted to know actually how you decide uh, what film technique to use or if you if you think about this when you read a novel is it based on what you feel when you read the novel how do you decide what how to go from from the the, the written text yeah. to the filmic text I answer both that. I, I actually I, I wouldn't mind seeing uh, a dead man again you know Johnny Depp and, and has this whole you know, the sort of perverse kind of idiosyncratic side, and, and that kind of blinded me to everything else. But I wouldn't mind seeing it again. Uh, uh, adapting books, you know, it's interesting. How do you, uh, I, uh, like I did a, a, an Elmore Leonard book, and Elmore Leonard has a cadence. You know, the, the way he uses gerunds, you know, he would say, and Charlie walking into the room looking at the girl thinking he would, he would want a shot of that, boom. Period. You know, it's all gerunds, or you know, uh, not gerunds, but uh, 